Thank you, Jack. So she'll do you when you leave, right? Yes. I'll give it to you now. It's a process. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I'm vaccinated. Oh, how you do it? You know what I was thinking about you not too long ago. After first means I can finally make it in here. So how have you been? Just saying in there. here. I'm vaccinated. You, you know what? You need a cover. We're gonna get you a cover for yours. I, I yeah. understand. We'll get you a cover. Okay, wait, 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 now or later? Well, oh. well, later. I have a meeting right now. Yeah. <laughs> I would just keep it safe. And Trustee Corkin is in route. And Ruth, she's on a show. Um, um, okay. Thank so, you. you would like to go to Trustee Rodriguez, um, talk to Alice and uh, and they they can wait. But if you want to move them up, how do you? I don't. Aww. <laughs> All right. <yeah. laughs> um. So I had uh, Michael print these out for us, just for the folks that didn't have. I mean, if you're going to do it, I'm fine, but just to, I don't think Alice has it either. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure that you get it. Let's go ahead. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Michael, can you take the roll? Ms. Butts? Here. Mr. Seifel? Here. Ms. Rodriguez? Here. Mr. Harrison? Here. Ms. Fryer? Here. And Mr. Parker? Here. Okay. Our first order of business is the approval of the regular board meeting of 12 15 22. Second. There's no omissions or additions. I move for adoption. Second. Ms. Butts? <clears throat> Mr. Seifel? Yeah. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Hairston? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. And the other one is the Joint Finance, Human Resource, and Community Service Committee meeting of 12 13 22. No additions or omissions. I move for adoption. Uh, second. Ms. Butt? Yes. Mr. Seifel? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. Okay, we have two presentations. I'm very excited about our first, and it's the first autobiography of Frederick Douglass and related resources. Please. <clears throat> um, so uh, my name is Heather Shannon. I'm the manager of Fine Arts and Special Collections. And uh, Director Thomas asked me to please share an extraordinary treasure from our collection. So the obvious choice for me was the, um, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, which was his first autobiography. He wrote three in all over the course of his life. It was published in 1845. And I am um, extremely excited about this book for several reasons. Uh, one of which is its frontispiece, which is a portrait of Douglas, thought to have been made after daguerreotype. And I brought one of my own daguerreotypes from my personal collection, although we have daguerreotypes in the photograph collection here at Maine, because if you've never held and looked at a daguerreotype, you haven't experienced a daguerreotype. So daguerreotype was the first form of photography, and it was a unique object. Um, so the the daguerreotype he lightly sat for in this portrait it was probably destroyed in the making of the engraving. We can talk about that later. Uh, but what's exceptional, exceptional about Douglas in photography is his full embrace of the medium, which when he sat for that portrait was only six years old. So the invention was announced in 1839 and he published his book in 1845 and it's believed he sat for his first portrait in 1841. Uh, Douglas um, as I said, wholeheartedly embraced photography because he saw it as a, 
palliative or as a way to combat racist stereotypes of African Americans, then circulate, circulating in the sort of popular visual culture of the United States in the 19th century. Um, the ex exceptional thing about our book is not only do we have this, this treasure, um, which um, it's just in itself very exciting. Um, but we also have contextualizing uh, texts, primary and secondary sources here at Maine. Uh, for example, in Youth Services, they have a, bio a biography of Frederick Douglass written for children. We have a very important book about Frederick Douglass's relationship with photography, which includes a catalog raisonné of all the known photographs uh, Douglass sat for, which I'm happy to uh, pass around. This is in the history department. Um, and by the way, it was not Lincoln, it was Frederick Douglass who um, was the most photographed American in the 19th century. Um, so his, his relationship with photography is very important. We also have in the social sciences department, uh, what is famously called Not in Glidden, which was a uh, race science text published initially in 1854. We have the sixth edition, I think. And it was the ideas, um, the ideas um, expressed in this particular uh, volume are the kinds of ideas that, that Frederick Douglass fought his life to dispel. And I could talk more about this, but I will not do that right now. It's a very important book in American anthropology or pre-anthropology. And then finally, I just wanted to show to you um, the way in which our more contemporary holdings really speak to the legacy of the Douglas narrative. This is a 1997 silhouette book by um, American artist, Kara Walker, who works in silhouettes. And she too is interested in combating um, uh, racist stereotypes of African-American people. And she does that through these silhouettes, which are sort of an, a late 18th, early 19th century phenomenon uh, in Europe and the United States. Oh, wow. And this book is called um, Freedom of Fable, which really speaks to the, the freedom that um, Douglas was fighting for in the 19th century throughout his life, but also supports the types of freedoms that African -Amer our African American neighbors are still fighting for today. And that is the end of my presentation. If anyone has is that your is that your family in the no, that is a just something a treasure you have yeah that I got excited about <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I just thought yeah. it could be that's we pretty love your excitement and thank you so much oh for what you did oh, oh, for oh, the sure. party for the foundation I mean, everybody was thrilled that night and I do want to say that um you know, sources like this, both primary and secondary, um, are really an important way for us to engage our community. And um, my colleague Stacy Brisker and I are actually um, going to be taking some of these objects to a high school in February and presenting them to photography and art students. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm extremely excited about this because um, these these works, um, these objects, represent sort of. The, the kids of Cleveland, their cultural inheritance. So it's very exciting to get the opportunity to share this with them. <coughs> thank you. Thank, and thank, thank you. you. I think uh, this is something that we should probably, now that we're doing a lot of uh, online and streaming, that, you know, the community, I didn't know we had this. So, well, there are more. Do you want to surprise I us? I think director would like me to do this every other month. I think and that's a great idea. I already idea. have plans for you all for March. So um, I know what, exactly what I want to bring in March. So, but I do take requests. So, uh, oh, we're, you're excused. You're not to do anything for St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so, so, so we want this to go back with you, right? Yeah. Um, if anybody's interested in checking it out, currently it's checked out to me. They're, they're welcome to take to check it out and take it home. There's a lot of photos of in here. Yeah. So the idea is uh, we have so many wonderful things in our special collections um, and we just don't get a chance to talk with the board about them and let you know some of the things. And I appreciate what Heather did was relate what we have in special collections to all of our collections, right? Um, we have folks come in, visit us from all over the world to see our special collections. Um, and, but uh, on a normal on the, on the day, um, our board doesn't get a chance to kind of know what those are. So little by little, you'll get to see them over a year's time, six different things that are set apart from other <coughs> libraries across the country. Sign me up for film trips. I, I really do need to get to know more about yeah. some of these things. Uh, 
And I, I, I think it's time for me to do another tour. Me and Tim Diamond kept setting dates for the tour. <laughs> My schedule kept getting too crazy. But we have so many wonderful things as part of this library, and it's time for me to re-familiarize myself. One of the things I, I will share with you that we uh, um, looked at, we've been finalizing the strategic plan. And as we were finalizing the strategic plan, we were looking at our organizational structure. And through that, we realized how complex, I mean, I realized when I came here and started working here, um, we are much more complex than almost every, what we consider normal library system. And we started looking at some of our other more complicated uh, and complex library systems, uh, Denver, San Antonio, Chicago, and we are far more, we're at the level with the New York public and Boston public with all of the things we provide our community. Because of that complexity, it's very hard for everybody to know all the things that we do, right? So, and the board. So part of that is trying to relate to you, how many different things do we do on a day-to-day -day basis for so many different communities, not only in the city, but in the region, in the state, and in the country. Uh, Director, if I could say that uh, uh, our exhibit cases are being uh, designed, and I hope we'll be here by June, and, and we're going to have Heather's going to be putting together a wonderful exhibit of treasures for when those arrive. So that'll be a nice opportunity to share at that point. Mm. Thank you, Mike. They'll all still be in special collections. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't get to introduce your partner in crime. Oh, he um, just left too. Yeah, Mark, no. uh, Mark Fox Morgan. Um, he's actually, as of September, <laughs> our new uh, visual arts librarian. And currently, he and I are working on, uh, and we're going to. Oh, I wanted to say, I have to say, um, Mark is amazing, and he and I are trying to work on getting art out to the branches and taking original objects out to the branches as well, um, because the wonderful thing about our library is that we are embedded in the community, and that and, and Mark and I would love to take advantage of that and to share the treasures we have in our department. Um, uh, but also, I want to thank Mr. Bird, who is in um, Erica's ops department. He uh, he's the director of education here, and he has been instrumental in introducing me to teachers and um, the heads of uh, departments and media specialists throughout the CMSD system. Um, Mr. Bird is a treasure, and I really appreciate his collegiality and generosity. So I just wanted to, I didn't want to put it up on the You know what, too, I mentioned uh, a while ago about uh, all the different neighborhood social media sites, too, that we could be identifying or notifying them of what we're having. Like if you said you're going to be going out to the various libraries, because I know the Cadell uh, neighborhood, the Detroit Shoreway, they all have their own little website. But I think that would be a good way to attract the neighborhood folks to let them know, look, you're going to be here on this day and here's what you're bringing. And I think that would be very helpful to educate not only, you know, us and the community. I so thank if, you. If, any, if you're familiar, there's that new uh, pivot center down in Clark Fulton area. It's, it's been only there a year or something, but uh, it was touted by the Art Museum and everyone else in the arts community because it's dance and um, all kinds of the arts, but they, when they have a big event, that would be a, another good place for you to go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. So now we have another exciting uh, presentation. I was in that <laughs> Thank you. Come on, Tim. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Appreciate the opportunity, Peter. And thanks. Really enjoyed working with you all and with Shanice on our agenda in Columbus. And really want to take a few minutes today just to bring you up to speed with respect to uh, what, what the climate is in Columbus, which I know many of you are probably familiar with. But just take a little deeper into it today and talk about uh, kind of where we go from here. So with that, I might, um, excuse me one second. I forgot to, uh, thought I had it on my iPad, it's not working. So um, again, just a, a brief overview with respect to the hot political landscape. 
No big surprises, I think, as we led up to the election. Uh, Republicans continue to control all the statewide offices, continue to control um, the, uh, um, the Supreme Court. Uh, so no big surprises there. But I just want to say with respect to the most important statewide office holder, and that is the governor, overall, he has historically on our issues with respect to the local government fund and the library fund has been very, very supportive. Um, notwithstanding the fact that we took, you know, you know, we got it back to one seven last time. We're going to hopefully work with him to get it back up at, at least that. But he overall has been a market improvement, candidly, uh, from where we were a few years back in terms of support from the administration level. Next, please. Uh, probably what's been more interesting and a little bit of a surprise. Um, can we go back one? I think I it skipped one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Next. That's that's the one I want. I'm sorry. Just to talk a little bit about the General Assembly itself. Uh, we have historic uh, majorities in both. We here in Ohio have historic, historic majorities in both the House and the Senate that we've not seen from either party before. Uh, the Republicans have 26 seats in the House, excuse me, in the Senate, seven Democrats. Uh, the House is 67 to 32, but that is a lot more interesting than the numbers suggest. And I know that you've heard a lot about that, but we're gonna talk a little bit about that and what it means for us. Just quickly on the Senate side, um, even though those numbers uh, obviously are heavily, heavily weighted for uh, Republicans, uh, you know, the, the Senate has a little bit of a different culture. Um, and they, they really like just institutionally to have bipartisan support on things. So even though those numbers on the surface, uh, you know, look, look, um, look lopsided, uh, Senator Nikki Antonio continues to be important for us, um, as does uh, um, uh, Senator Smith on the east side. Those two folks will still on issues like this be, be very important. So I don't wanna, I wanna underscore that as we talk. Senator Dolan, again, continues to be chair of finance. Again, overall, he's been uh, pretty supportive of us on the PLF, so that's, that's fundamentally good news. The Ohio House, that is a different and wild story. Uh, there are 67 Republican members in the House, 32 Democrats, and I'm sure many of you who have read some of the controversy with respect to the leadership in the House. Uh, back in November, the Republican caucus got together and they decided that they were gonna elect uh, Representative Marin, who by his own admission is very conservative, about as conservative as you get uh, in the Ohio House of Representatives. Uh, and there was a pledge that was made by all the Republicans, all 67 Republicans at that time, that whoever prevailed in that process would, uh, all 67 would vote for before the full house on January 3rd. Yeah, keep in mind that the entire house represents the speaker and the speaker pro tem. Those aren't, those aren't elected by caucuses. I mean, that is just a straight out vote by the, by the general, by the house of representatives. All the other leadership positions are not, by the way, those are elected by caucuses. Well, Representative Marin uh, made a big mistake uh, in that when, uh, when those 67 Republicans pledged that they would vote one way in uh, January, he actually believed them. Uh, <laughs> and as a result of that, I think, you know, made some, made some errors with respect to his approach. And it all led up to really, I think the weekend before the, uh, the vote was taken on January 3rd, where there was kind of this rush on both this, from the Democrats perspective and a core group of Republicans that um, got together and they elected Jason Stevens as the speaker and not Merrick. Jason uh, Stevens is down from Southern Ohio. Again, he was elected all the entire Democrat caucus voted for him uh, and 22 Republicans, which gave him a 55, 55 seat majority. Uh, I think on balance, particularly with respect to a lot of our issues, that's probably a pretty good outcome candidly. Um, but also Representative Olslager was elected speaker pro tem We've worked with Senator Olslager, Representative Olslager for many years. He was the chair of the Senate Finance Committee up until uh, this General Assembly was chair of the House Finance Committee and is really one of the more seasoned members in the General Assembly and has been pretty supportive on a lot of our issues. 
Um, the challenge is going to be is that there's, you essentially now have three caucuses in the House. You've got the Republican caucus where 45 people voted for Derek Marin. You've got the Democrat caucus where you have 30, 34 folks, or uh, excuse me, 32 folks who, who have their caucus. And then you've got the 22 Republicans who voted with the Democrats. So there are really kind of three caucuses. How many of the 22 are from Northern Ohio? Uh, Tom Patton. Okay. Uh, Tom voted with him. And I think of the 22, that might have, you know, we don't have a lot of, particularly in Cuyahoga County, we don't have a lot of them. Um, but, but. They just uh, defeated Monica from the West Side. Right. Yeah. I, I think uh, Representative Patton is now. It was redistricted. Correct. And he will be running for the Senate, by the way. It's already essentially announced it. But because you have these three caucuses. Uh, so Representative Patton is term limited in the House. Okay. So Does that he mean is. He run against Nikki? No, no, no. He will run in, in, in Senator Dolan's district. Okay. Dolan's going better up well. Well, he's running for the U.S. Yeah. Uh, voters will decide where he goes, right? right. right. Um, but but uh, and I should mention, and we'll talk about this in a second. We still have redistricting to deal with. But in any event, you know, our challenge is going to be in the budget process, trying to navigate through those three coalitions. I think the Democrats are genuinely, I think they feel comfortable that on some of the more controversial issues, the election of Jason Stevens at, at a minimum slows those things down. Um, so in some ways, it really leads to a more balanced house. Mm -hmm. From an ideological perspective, the question becomes the politics and whether, you know, how Speaker, excuse me, Speaker Stevens manages that. Could we go back one? I'm sorry, these ended up in reverse order. Uh, I just wanted to talk real briefly. Uh, there were a series of issues at the end of last year. We essentially ended up having a, another major appropriation bill in a lame duck session, and a bunch of stuff was thrown in there. Um, and I just wanted to mention 45 quickly. There was nothing in there that directly affected us, but it was a $6 billion spending bill, which that's a big number, even for the state of Ohio. Uh, much of that was, um, was from ARPA dollars, and essentially about 900 million of it, uh, I think, apologize, it's hard for me. Yeah, they spent 1.4 billion of the $1.9 billion left of the ARPA dollars. So that still leaves about a half a billion dollars in ARPA dollars that are sitting there that will likely be appropriated um, through the, uh, uh, in the, in the general operating budget. Just wanted to mention real quickly, a couple of these other issues because there was such high profile election, quote unquote election reform was passed. Um, the, other, the other thing um, you know, that we had talked a lot about this concept of divisive issues and in, uh, in the legislation that had been introduced that would prohibit public entities from talking about divisive issues and creating some board that would decide what that meant, which is, you know, creepy, scary, however you want to characterize it. But those uh, those got whittled down to uh, dealing with school, school districts, although there were still bills pending there that would affect us, but none of those in the end moved at the end of the 134th General Assembly. Next, please, and please interrupt if, <clears throat> okay, so I just wanted to mention there has also been some staff changes and there will likely be a few more. Uh, again, this is important because we work with a lot of these folks on the budget issues. Um, the good news is, is that um, and over at OBM, most of the folks that we have worked with have not changed. That's pretty stable. Um, but with this new chief of staff um, and uh, this new policy director, there's going to be a new tax commissioner. Again, tax commissioner. Oddly enough, he's kind of important for us, right? Because the way our revenues are calculated in that, and once we have that new commissioner, uh, we'll take the necessary steps to do introductions and those things. But there's, you know, in the second term of an administration, there are historically significant turnover. So I would expect, particularly once you get beyond the first six months of the year in the budget, uh, that we'll see more of it. The governor's priorities, he's been pretty uh, vocal about this mental health initiatives, <coughs> mental health uh, initiatives uh, because of so many of the issues that we're, chat, that we're facing these days. And he has been, that really is, uh, I think his number one priority in attacking the uh, issue of affordable housing. Interestingly enough, 
Those are both issues that I think he's going to find a lot of support from the <laughs> Democrats on. So I think that when you when you see the budget that the governor introduces, my guess is on a lot of things, you're going to see a lot of support from the Democrat caucus in the House and in the Senate as well. Next, please. Tim, let me ask you a question. Certainly. I don't know if it's related or not, but we have an advantage of having a secretary who's in charge of HUD in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Have we seen any increase in applications for that affordable housing or anything through the state? And most of all, locally, do you know? The, uh, the applications to HUD or through? Congresswoman Fudge is now secretary of HUD. Right. Home so, person, homegrown. Right. So what's interesting uh, is that is that there has been an enormous amount of money available through ARPA in the state of Ohio right. for rental assistance and affordable housing. And what's breathtaking is how little of it has been spent. That's why I'm getting, I saw them on my way to, because one minute people complain about where it came from. And if they need it next minute, it's sit, still sitting there. In yes. fact, some is still sitting in the city clear. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been, and uh, I've met Lydia Mahal, who's the director of development, who oversees community development for the state of Ohio. I think it's been a, a, a it's been frustrating for them because you, everybody knows the need is there, but yet there's people aren't applying for it. And yes, we then, need to be helping get the word out that it's available. You know, oh, the word is out. I can tell you, that there's been a meeting with mayors. That's what I mean, the mayor and all of them. And that's who has to apply for it. Need to tell people or something. And I think they've been working with the mayor's office here in Cleveland. And I, I can I can get some more information, Trustee Hairston. I, I just, uh, I can get some more information on that. I've done a fair amount of work on the affordable housing side. And it's uh, it's just been interesting. And I know, like I said, I was at a uh, meeting with the director and just her expressing the frustration that we just we can't get this money out the door. Right. And I think you're right because they're working very closely with the mayor of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are other presentations that I was a part of where almost begging people to put the application in. Yeah. It's... <clears throat> Tim, can, can I ask something here? Sure. In, in terms of um, the controversy that's going to happen in the House, to what extent would you think that it's going to make extremists, for lack of a better term, the book banners, <laughs> since those are the ones we care about the most, um, more outrageous in their demands? Or do you think it's possible that this pre-caucus situation will mollify the extremists? I, I think that my sense is, and again, this is a dynamic business and things change and they move quickly. So, I, you know, there's never any certainty as this is, you know, one, one bad story and you know, a firestorm will erupt because everybody kind of chases headlines, right? My sense is, is that particularly with respect to the divisive issues concept, and when, I, when we talk about action steps later, we have that on the list to watch it very carefully. But my sense is, is the energy behind that has dissipated a bit. That's great. Um, uh, it's just, it, it feels like it's dissipated a bit. There was not a lot of enthusiasm for it in the Senate. Um, you know, the speaker still gets to control, you know, what gets on the agenda. Uh, he has to be sensitive to, you know, all 55 members that elected him. I, I think probably that even before this, that the steam was out of those things a little bit. But, but you know, again, I, I caution you to watch it very carefully. Is there a lot of push for tax cuts, I suppose? So. Well, I, I want to mention as you go, you know, the, the policy agenda in 23, general revenue fund operating budget, which we'll talk about very quickly, tax reform, tax cuts. You know, the, the state is flush with cash, and that always uh, that always results in, you know, everybody likes to say they cut taxes. I would be very surprised if the governor introduces a budget that cuts taxes, but um, I suspect that the House and Senate will do so, even though I think the Democrat caucus uh, in the House has expressed their, I don't think they're going to go along with it, but we'll see how that plays out. Um, but yes, uh, it, it will definitely it will definitely be discussed. I wanted to mention Ohio retirement systems. Uh, again, 
this is not this is this affects every public employer but there has been a lot of discussion over at police and fire and now strs in which the boards are asking for increases What's well, that's oh, state teachers retirement oh, yeah. um, i think there are five funds all together my son and friends is striking right now <laughs> um, but yeah, but time, I, I think know, it's only you know, a matter of time. Yes, sir. It was a long time that they tried to move STRS into Social Security because it got so much money. In it. Yeah, that, um, but that wouldn't work. I think I think over the years there have been there have been efforts at the federal level um, to try to eliminate these public pensions, but there's too much political steam behind them and, and I don't see that but but there you know when you look at what's happened in the market um, these pensions funds are are feeling a pinch um, you know they, they assume a three percent return every year which is a big return and there's nobody's getting eight percent so they are looking at you know they're looking at big holes actuarially over time so again two of them have taken the lead police and fire and and uh, have, have you know, there, there's, it's a substantial increase. And what's interesting in both instances, it's been a request from, from it's been a request to increase the employer's contribution and not the employee's contribution. Um, so- <laughs> And then Carrie look at each other. <laughs> so there's nothing yet, but I just, I put that up there because that is, uh, that's gonna be coming, I think, unless there's a miraculous turnaround in the market in the next six months. Can you ask what percentage they're proposing for SDRS and safety? Well, so safety, right now, the police and the fire, um, have they have different contribution rates. And I, historically, how that happened, I'm not sure. Don't hold me to this, but I think the employer contribution for like police is 17% or fire is 17% and police is 21%. And I think they want to, We'll boost them both to 25. I'll get you those numbers, but they're 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 not small. And as you can imagine, ours is 14. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. No, this would take it over 20. And interesting on STRS, the board basically recommended an increase, but they didn't give an amount. They just said we need an increase, and you know they kind of threw it to the general assembly, uh, but they did not give an amount. My guess is they were afraid to because. Once they mentioned the number, it was going to put sticker shock in every school district. Yep. So, yeah. uh, so those are in those two instances, they're not small numbers, which is why I just wanted to put it on the radar screen. Redistricted reapportion, reapportionment. You know, we're going to have new legislative districts in two years uh, because of this, the outcome of the Supreme Court. I suspect whatever the commission does will likely be approved by the Supreme Court. Um, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, again, we'll keep our eyes on the uh, divisive issues concept, uh, capital budget. That'll be by the end of the year. We'll be um, uh, back on the agenda. We always watch the property tax issues. This past General Assembly, there were multiple issues with respect to property taxes, how they're assessed, how you get on the ballot, all those types of things. And those are obviously we need to watch those carefully to ensure the integrity of the of our property tax stream. Next. Uh, I just wanted to, this is a, a bit of an, I put together an outline of the budget. I must say I was very proud of the fact that I was able to figure that out. <laughs> Claire, who does a lot of this stuff, is on maternity leave and usually does this. Um, but in any event, there's just a timeline, if you will, and it's it's important because there are critical periods. And I believe on, on the 31st, the governor is going to give a state of the state address. Right after that, the next day, I think we'll see a blue book, which will be kind of an outline of the budget. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll see the actual language for the budget. And then we're off to the races on hearings. And the House will take, I assume you guys have a copy of this, but in the House, there will be a, um, uh, that will be voted out probably sometime uh, right after Easter. Then it goes to the Senate, which will vote it out around Memorial Day. And then much of June will be about a conference committee. and. You know, this thing is going to move in several different directions between now and then, depending on what's in the as introduced budget. Uh, you know, we'll be working both the House and the Senate at every one of these points on our issues. Next, please. Uh, just wanted to mention the state's got a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> revenues, right, just, just this, this far this year are up 3.8% over 
overestimates, and um, they were pretty aggressive with their estimates. They've got a half a billion dollars in excess revenues. So that continues to grow, whether we hit a recession or not is unclear. Um, what was interesting though is December was the slowest monthly growth rate for all of 20, for fiscal year 23. So from July through the end of the year, December, I think was the first sign that things might be slowing down a bit because it was the, it was the smallest uh, surplus of all of them. Next, please. Uh, again, we talked about this in terms of our priorities, really focusing from now through the end of June is really about the budget uh, and, and the PLF, the Library for the Blind. And again, um, focusing on the property tax stuff, there will be some tax reforms that go into this bill. And of course, every time they start doing those things and it hits the base of the state property tax, it ultimately directly affects us. So we'll be watching those things very closely. And then, uh, as I said, divisive concepts, uh, we'll, we'll continue to watch that closely. And again, in the type of environment we're in, I suspect that there are things that are gonna pop up um, and uh, we just need to be prepared to deal with them. Uh, latter part of the year, uh, uh, September, October, kind of the quiet phase of the capital budget starts again. And, we have historically, at least at that point, taken a look and said, geez, are there things that we could partner with and perhaps pursue? And, and uh, that'll be time to do that again then. Thanks, please. If I could just say something quickly and for Trustee Fryer is new to us, um, funding from the PLF, which is the Public Library Fund, is about 40% yeah. of our, our funding. Um, we received funding from the state for the Ohio Library for the Blind and Physically Disabled, which we run. So they provide us with about $5 million through that. And we've had in, in the past, that money has come out of what other libraries get. So um, Tim and others work with us because sometimes we're all in line with the other libraries and sometimes it's us against the other world of libraries. And so we have to fight them off because they would rather that money just be put into the general fund and then we not have any money to do that. So what they do is they, if it's 1.7%, they calculate the amount, and then they take the $5 million off the top and then distribute right. it, right? And our public library fund was just decreased on the December recertification by 1.5 million. Is that because of revenues? Yeah, yeah. from the yeah. re-estimated revenues. Yeah, and just... <clears throat> the, the library for the buying, uh, and physically disabled is, has been a football in Columbus for all of my 36 years. Mm -hmm. um, it has been kicked back and forth. Every time we're lucky enough to get a state legislator elected whose mom is blind or whose aunt is blind, we do better for a while. <laughs> Since somebody wants to offend that legislature, none of the colleagues do. Uh, currently, I think there's still only just one uh, legislator who's connected to the blind community. Um, so what happens then is you know, all sorts of games. Early in the, in the history, they basically started challenging what we were charging for the space that the, the Library for the Blind and Physically Disabled uses. And they said, we charge too much. Cleveland real estate's too expensive. We should move the Library for the Blind out to the suburbs or something. I mean, it was, that, it was that kind of nonsense. And for all of the 36 years, it's just been a football. And, and, uh, Tim has been good enough to keep us from being kicked around quite as much as we were in my early years on the board. And, and uh, that's something we got to keep working on. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, right. and the other historical thing is we used to split the state with Cincinnati about taking care of those patrons. And Cincinnati couldn't keep up, they couldn't do it. So we're the whole state. So all 88 counties turned to us for those materials. Wow. And although the federal government provides fr a frank, a free postage aspect of it, um, most of that cost is basically on us to manage. And it's, it's a pretty significant job and one that's not well recognized in the larger Cleveland community. When the, we're really the, the center for the whole state on these issues, like we are on the center for the book. 
to, they were trying to do that elsewhere, but nobody else really cared about the Center for the Book as much as we did. So we run for all 88 counties, the Ohio Center for the Book as well. So. And we even have a sensory garden for the blind. <laughs> right. So, but that's just historically, so you know some of that. And any of that history stuff, you know, you can always ask me. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> that's for sure. That, that gal. <laughs> so, real quick, and I know I'm. I, over time here, but Tom, just they even have Lincoln around. <laughs> in terms of our uh, action steps, obviously we continue. It's important that we continue to coordinate with the Ohio Library Council. It's important, um, as the director suggested. That doesn't mean we always agree on everything, but it's the coordination is critical. The director has done a great job over the past year, uh, and this will be important, uh, reaching out to members. We've had some meetings with the director of Shanice. My favorite was with Senator Serena. Uh, yeah, that was a good meeting. Yes, it was a great meeting. We were in the rare collection room and he was talking about his childhood on, on uh, Wilder House in Little Italy. In Little Italy. He was literally talking about the library and looked up and there the painting was on the wall of his library. It was terrific. Where he got his first kiss. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, we learned a lot. <laughs> but anyhow, you know, he's now the vice chair of finance uh, uh, and he's on the controlling board. So we need to continue just that outreach. We've got, as I said, we have to continue to work with our members and we will continue to do so. How, how big is the Senate Finance Committee? It uh, it's about, no, it's not that many. I think it's about nine. So we basically have in Northeast Ohio, five of the nine. Well, yeah, we've got uh, Senator Serena, Senator Dolan. Um, I don't think Boy, Smith is on finance. Okay. Yeah, those are just folks I, I uh, in a lot of them, particularly in the house, we don't know who the members are. Although that's Bride Sweeney uh, is the ranking member on finance. She may end up being the most important Democrat in, in the Ohio House of Representatives. So she's in our district and, and we need to focus on her a lot. Um, again, you know, she'll, ha she'll have some say in this what uh, uh, final uh, uh, bullet there. And then of course we have our legislative day. So it really is continuing obviously to identify our priorities, which we have, reaching out to the appropriate decision makers and just continuing to work the halls. So, and just for everybody's knowledge, uh, legislative day this year will be April 26th, Wednesday, April 26th. Tim, I have no idea who is representative beforehand. A uh, new representative from South Euclid, but I have no idea. Yeah, and he represents a, a small part of Cleveland, actually. So, and, and where was he before? Because I don't have any idea. Uh, I, I just met him. I, I went to a Democrat delegation breakfast last week. I just met him. <coughs> we're we're going to have lunch. I, I don't know. So some new faces there. But that spells opportunity. Yeah. So with that, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank and thank you, you so much. Um, there are no communications. Um, and again, make sure we mark our calendar for legislative day. Um, so we're going to go a little bit out of order. I'm going to go ahead and do the president's report today. Uh, before we go into finance, our last finance to be done by Trustee Saifula. Um, um, I would like to recognize you with the resolution. So do I have to bring the whole thing or can I just no, yeah, not, 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 it, it was it's just a joke. <laughs> There's a lot, and I would I, I would be honored if you would let me to read the whole thing. Uh trustee Cyphlo. Um gotta stand? Yes, please. I'm bringing up David. Whereas Alan A. Cyphola has served faithfully and with distinction on the Board of Library Trustees since his first appointment on March 27, 2007. Wow, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and whereas as a graduate of Glenville High School, and you know, he loves his tart blooders, we all know that. Um, and the Ohio State, no, no. oh, the Ohio University. Whoops. Whereas he was a founder of the Department for African American Studies and a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity and drawing on his long career as a communications administrator, 
including five years as the Light Air's Head of Marketing <clears throat> and Public Relations from 1995 to 2000, Mr. Saipula has contributed significantly and selflessly to the growth and development of the Cleveland Public Library as a responsive community organization. And whereas under Mr. Saipula's dedicated leadership, the library has achieved significant positive outcome for the residents of Cleveland through initiatives, including safe spaces for children, literacy and tutoring services, 3D printing, library cards for all students in the CMST school district, daily food assistance, Cleveland Housing Court and legal aid services, and the circulation of tablets and Wi-Fi hotspots. And whereas, in addition to his library board service, Mr. Saifla has devoted countless volunteer hours to strengthening the civic bonds among his fellow citizens by operating an art gallery community meeting space with his wife, Alice, by serving on the board of the Clyde Robin Community Center, by founding the Anansi Artists Alliance, and by establishing the East 108th Street Community Garden, among many other initiatives. And whereas the Board of Trustees wishes to acknowledge Mr. Cyclist's years of dedicated service, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Library Trustees for itself and on behalf of the library staff and the community commends Mr. Cyclist for his exemplary public service and extends appreciation and sincere best wishes to its esteemed and valued colleague for continued success in all his endeavors. Thank you very much. It's been a, an honor and a privilege to serve on, on this board in the library, and it's been an important part of my life uh, throughout my existence. So we wanted to share some library pictures with you. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're going to bring them up here. On the and we have the board and our fearless leader. Can you see the screen? Okay. But before he does that, let's look at his, his let's look at his pictures. <laughs> that's your your, that's your box card. Your library card. That's his employment. That's your employee card. Before we went electronic. Yes. Oh, we still have them. We still we're still using them. That's how much you were making. <laughs> Wow, I'm not making that much now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is some of the work that Trustee Sackler did as, as the head of marketing. Yeah, so from Lee Stokes, uh, how instrumental you were in helping with the building standards. <laughs> There's a variety of photos there. I don't what, where, Do you remember the first photo on the left? What that was about? I don't. That's when you walk around calling some village. I want to know were you driving the train? Uh, that's connected to Mayor White's uh, promotion of the uh, train collection that used to be in the uh, City Hall Rotunda every Christmas, yeah. and Ellen was always part of it. Really? Sure that. Yeah, that's oh, right. Am I right? Uh, Sounds good, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> That's the person I already used. Wow. 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 Oh. Yeah, we'll send them to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say to you that uh, it's good to know that we have two of us in the room because we got them all surrounded. 
I'm a Kappa brother of this. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. We got a long, long. Oh, we got three. Yeah, three. Oh, right. Right. It's over. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> we have been together such a long time. It, it has been, and uh, we still see each other from time to time. Well, we can still talk about West Virginia now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> not in West Virginia. We have a lot in common, a lot of political wars. And how it's always been just like this. Smooth. <laughs> All the rough of the feathers. And it gets a lot of stuff done. And I've been with him, I've been behind him most of the time, following him. But we're going to miss you here. Yeah. Because you keep the same demeanor. Uh, have to pull my coach out and slow me down when she does it. Uh, I wear because she does all the time. But love you and you know it. Love your family. Yeah. yeah. And if you ever, if you ever need me to come and, and sit in the gallery at some point, you know, for any particular reason. In other words, Father, he's ready to volunteer. He's <laughs> getting so much money in this job. <laughs> so if I could get Miss Alice Sarah, to come up, we want to take some photos with you guys up here. Oh, there she is. Good. And if the board doesn't mind coming over, first winner. Well, hold on, let's, let's get a picture with him and his family. And then we will get the board all in together. Uh, Okay. Yeah. 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 No, you can both volunteer. <laughs> I love y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to get up there, y'all. <laughs> One, two, three. Okay, now you can come here. All right, well, now everybody, let's take a picture with maybe come up front here. I just want to say this about uh, these two. They have been in my life since I was 17 years old. They, uh, I was a high schooler when they came in my life. So to serve on the board with them is just crazy. And uh, to be with you, you know, you're special to me and my family. Yeah, you're pretty good for coming on. I appreciate that. <laughs> And, and I would be remiss if I didn't add this, that Diane says that the uh, um, stadium would have been built without you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. uh, all that together when this community was in uproars about building a new stadium that you could browse. And uh, Alan was part of that as well. So um, I know it's not in the resolution, but it's something I know about. So, so. Well, now we've moved to finance. Trustee Sackville, would you mind um, moving Exhibit 8 up? Uh, Ben's here, so we can give him his afternoon back. <laughs> is Tim on the clock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. That's another part of it we don't want to say. Yeah, when, he, uh, when he finished, you should have closed the door. <laughs> I 
Exhibit A, resolution authorizing the Brigham of Cosgrove, John Henry, LLC, for Asian and Lobbyist Services. Uh, be it resolved <clears throat> that the executive director, CEO, or his designee is authorized to enter into an agreement with Timothy J. Cosgrove of Cosgrove, <clears throat> John Henry, LLC, for the period commencing January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2023. And an amount not to exceed four thousand dollars per month, month and forty-eight thousand dollars per year, which expenditure shall be charged to general fund account one one two zero 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 five three dash five three seven one zero professional services, in which agreement shall be subject to the review and approval of the director of legal affairs. So second. Response? Yes. Mr. Seifler. Yes. Mr. Corrigan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. It's always a surprise when I hear Susie's voice come out of nowhere. Oh, Lord, we're going to do it again. Civil <laughs> one resolution to accept gifts for the month of December. It is resolved that the gifts described in the gift report of December 2022 be accepted upon the conditions connected with said gifts. In accordance, I'm sorry. In accordance with section 3375.40K of the Ohio Revised Code, so moved. Second. Ms. Butts? Yes. But. <laughs> Mr. Seifel? Yes. Mr. Corrigan? Tom. Tom, just say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. I'll vote for Tom. Yes. 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 <laughs> Perfect. Uh, exhibit two, first of the year 2023 appropriation. We have resolved that the sums indicated in the attached first amendment of the year 2023 appropriation schedule be approved. So moved. Second. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Saitwa? Yes. Mr. Corrigan? <clears throat> Ms. Yeah. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Ms. Fryer? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Parker? Yes. Tom? Not Tom again. Tom, say yes. Yes. <laughs> I was here for the Finance Committee hearing and voted yes, so it's just been he said. You see the type of clout Mr. Seifler has? All he has to do is tell him. <laughs> That's why we're going to give the seat right there. <laughs> Exhibit three resolution to authorize payment of fees <clears throat> to the Cleveland Special Revenue Fund covering the period January 1st, 2023, to December 31st, 2023. Being resolved that the Board of Trustees authorizes the payment of one million four hundred forty-seven thousand one hundred ninety-two dollars and eighty-six cents to the Clean Net Special Revenue Fund, effective January first, twenty twenty-three. The expenditure being charged to general fund account one three zero one zero zero five three dash five three nine zero zero. Other purchase services. So moved. Second. Second. And Carrie, I just want to make, we did the record on Tuesday, but for the record today, uh, we figured out again recently how much Clevenet saves all the member libraries. And, and what was that estimate again? Oh, when well, we reduced the costs. Right. We reduced it by a third of the unencumbered balance, which was just 300, just over $336,000. And there, there's the realization that um, um, they just did a study in, for every dollar spent, believe <clears throat> that saves our our folks nineteen dollars, right? The return on investment study. Yeah. So, um, us serving as the foundation helps our region to a great deal for be able to get access to things they'd never be able to get to. And Jasmine, uh, we have forty-seven of these different libraries going all the way to Andover on the Pennsylvania border and Kinsman and yeah. Sandusky on the Pretty west side. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Seifel? Yes. Mr. Corrigan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. Exhibit four resolution to accept gifts from EHC. It is all that Cleveland Public Library Board of Trustees, pursuant to the authority set forth 
NRC 3375.40K hereby accepts a gift from the EHH Foundation through Key Bank National Association Trust Division in the amount of $39,000 to deposit into the Founders Fund account number 2030046-46100-29801. Restricted gifts to be used for the Cleveland Reeves Challenge can be a further resolved that the Executive Director, CEO, is designated is authorized to enter into and execute any documents, agreements, and instruments as may be necessary or appropriate to receive and extend the gift, including those in excess of $25,000, to effectuate the terms and conditions of the gift. And this resolution, which agreements and instruments shall be subject to the approval of the library's director of legal affairs, and be as further resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Cleveland Public Library expresses its heartfelt gratitude for this extraordinary gift to the library from the EHH Foundation through the Bank National Trust Association Trust Division. So moved. Second. Ms. Bunce? Yes. Mr. Cyphalov? Yes. Mr. Horgan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Hairston? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Parker? Yes. Exhibit five resolution to accept libraries accelerating learning grant from the Ohio Department of Education. Be it resolved that the Cleveland Public Library Board of Trustees, pursuant to the authority set forth in RC 3375.40K, hereby accepts the grant from the Ohio Department of Education in the amount of $250,000 to be deposited into the early literacy fund account. 258042-42100-188001 Federal Aid and authorizes the Executive Director CEO as designated to execute such instruments or agreements as are necessary to effectuate the terms of the grant, including those for expenditures in excess of $25,000, which agreements shall be subject to the approval of the Director of Federal Affairs. So, okay. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Cyclone? Yes. Mr. Corgan? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Hairston? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Park? Yes. Exhibit six resolution authorizing amendment to agreement with Land Studio Inc. for <coughs> project support and consulting services. <coughs> Be a resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Cleveland Public Library authorizes executive director. CEO is designated to enter into an amendment to the agreement for an additional one year term of Land Studio Week, subject to the approval of the Director of Legal Affairs to provide project support and consulting services for a fee not to exceed $65,500, including reimbursables, to be charged to the general fund account 1120053. Dash five three seven one zero professional services. So moved. Second. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Cyclop? Yes. Mr. Porter? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. Uh, exhibit seven <clears throat> resolution authorizing payment of insurance panel rate to Ogletree Dakins for employment matters. Be it resolved that the Board of Library Trustees authorizes the Cleveland Public Library to pay the hourly <coughs> panel rate amount specified by supplies insurer, Chubb, and negotiated with Ogletree, Dakin, Snatch, Smoke, and Stewart, PC, on an as needed basis to provide legal and employment legal advice and representation for any litigation covered by the library's employment practices liability insurance policy, which expenditure shall be charged in the general fund account 1140053-53710. Professional services and requires that the fiscal officer continue to provide a report to the Board of Library Trustees of fees paid to Ogletree on a quarterly basis. So we'll Second. Ms. Bunt? Yes. Mr. Cyclone? Yes. Mr. Corrigan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Hairston? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. Exhibit 9, resolution approving early work in the authorization for Wallace Branch project. Prior. 
Here is the sum of the board authorizes the CEO or executive to negotiate and execute such agreements or instruments as are necessary to effectuate the terms of this resolution and to perform the work described in this resolution for the new law scratch by Gavain Building Company in the amount of $129,989 to be charged to construction tax exempt fund 402 and or the construction taxable fund 403, which agreements or instruments shall be subject to the approval of the Director of Legal Affairs, so Second. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Saikala? Yes. Mr. Corgan? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. Let me ask a little more about walls. I, I guess since I live so close to walls, I get neighbors asking me, so why didn't you demolish it if you can't start construction, blah, blah, blah. So I know you said the name of the people you're working with is their Northwest Neighbors. It's called Nonstick the Churchill, right? Um, so, but what what recourse do we have? I mean, sort of now it's just in limbo, nothing's happening, right? Um, so to answer your first question, we chose to demolish the building because uh, under the assumption that we need to move into construction. Right. And we had to demolish in order to make the summer of 22 construction, yeah. right. which obviously we ended up missing anyway. So that was that was the rationale between the demolition and our partners demolished their building at the same time. So we yeah. were very confident that we're both all in on this. Yeah, I think the neighbors were understanding that at the time, but now that was how many months ago, right? Correct. That was June 2022, so six, seven months ago. So mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't doubt our partner's commitment to the project at the time. Right. The, the landscape changed financially for them. We had made some contingency allowances, so we were still able to move forward. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's limbo. We've got a good design. We've got planning commission approval. We've got permits. We're ready to build. Um, our alternative at this point is wait for our partner to build the to build the combined building that we envisioned all along. Or to discuss um, breaking the partnership and then going to law. I don't think we're there yet. Um, so I guess my recommendation, and I talk about all, all the time, is to kind of stay the course, um, be patient a little while longer. And so Gilbane right now is doing nothing. We are. We've got the project and kind of a life support. Plan. They're doing very little. The project will need to be rebid. The base we collected last year. There's no way. Um, so it will be have to be another day. Right. And the other thing to make clear, I think, for the record is that um, what happened is when the project was bid, the money that the, our partner had to then put in was increased because of where the bids came in. And the construction costs did that everywhere, as we've seen in all the projects we've got going. They're, they're not as capable as we are to find other funds. Um, we basically sometimes can move project that's being done later, we can take from those funds to, to use stuff for now. They don't have that kind of uh, luxury. On the other hand, the tax credit that's available to them is at this point still nine or 10 times greater than the gap. So the likelihood that they, they walk away easily from that nine or $10 million, I don't know what they actually- Almost 12. Almost $12 million because of a shortfall of a million two or something like that, two and, a half, two and a half is still remote, but it's possible. And on the other hand, um, because of that differential, we're hoping that there'll be some other uh, ability to raise those funds. Uh, it's for their part of the project, it's not ours, it's not ours to do. But on the other hand, the, the feeling is, particularly, for instance, this affordable initiative that we heard about that the governor is about, right. well, this is an affordable housing project. It is. It's subsidized senior housing. So uh, uh, it would be more than appropriate for the governor to step in with our affordable housing project monies to make the gap up. And we're hoping that that sort of thing happens. Where else were they planning to get the money from originally? Was there HUD money involved? And it wasn't HUD money. It was all, it was all and, and forgive me, I'm not totally savvy on, on uh, the Ohio tax credits that were granted to them, but that it was totally financed through the Ohio tax credits. And they made the exact <coughs> the case before they just made, which is, I can't tell you today how we're going to get that last couple of million dollars. I can just tell you, I've never seen anybody, this is what the CEO is telling me, 
I've never seen anyone leave $12 million on the table and walk away from it for the lack of just a little bit more. Um, so I, I'll admit that the six months has passed is, is grown a little frustrating. I understand why they wanted to wait for the political landscape and the elections and pursue all the opportunities that trusted the Corgan has just mentioned to you. Um, so I, I guess I would just personally, I feel like we just need to be a little more patient. So maybe all of us could somehow lobby for some more of that affordable housing money. That well, that's exactly why I was asking the question that's today. Tom, Tom was reading everything I was saying. Yep. The money's sitting there. Exactly. So, what, I wonder if many of us, I mean, if it would help to write letters or anything. Uh, I think that in politics, uh, let them do it. But, yeah. And, and I, I do want to correct one thing that private developers have walked away from 12 million because of a gap of 2 million. But a public interest entity like our partner here has never done it. And, and so, I, I think it's still pretty remote that the project doesn't go forward. It's just you can't really. Uh, sign a contract so the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and, and they're two and a half million for that. So that's the problem. So the way we looked at it and had the conversation with John Lang is um, every month we'll talk to you about this. And at some point in time, if the board decides it's, it's beyond the time we're willing to wait, we will start the process of breaking well, the why do Why do we wait? I mean, maybe it would be appropriate to do something now. I don't think it is. I mean, we've waited for other projects as well. I think we should wait. We've waited for other projects and we've had positive outcomes. You ever so heard of, for you the know, sake I'm of sorry, six I'm months. Sorry. I'm sorry. You ever heard of Martin Luther King? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was long, saying without hey, saying it. We waited a long time. I was saying that without saying it, but we've waited. And I we think just six have months. Some patience and they, I think they're doing everything they can do. Plus, I have a bias about the design of that building. I it's know, gorgeous. you're a big fan of it. So yeah, gorgeous. six okay. months is, it, it is a lot, but it's not. No, We've no. waited longer for others. In John's words, I was just, no, just John. The neighbors are used to well, they'll be all right. Just tell them we're still working on it. Yeah. I mean, well, no, and there's always going to people. I mean, that's my neighborhood too, Alice, yeah. as it is yours and Tom's, and it's all of ours. We all have a big interest. And if we're at six months, I think we could wait a little bit longer and people could be, a, you know, the luxury that we have here in the city of Cleveland is that there is a, a library within a mile of each door. So a walking mile. So Fortunately for your neighbors, they do have several other branches that they could go to, what, whichever mode of transportation they get to. So at this point, I want to keep um, see what happens. Yeah, I'm and, excited. And just so you know, Trustee Betts, we are reaching out to Councilwoman Spencer, and I had a conversation yesterday with County Executive Brene. Oh, so know you know, we 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 know that this can't go on without some things but they they're they're having those same conversations um and uh i think they you know they're trying desperately to find mm -hmm. money as well um so hopefully they find it so yes for all you indeed. Can, John. thank you did we vote on that or did we i did. Stop? No, we did. <laughs> yes, thank you all right so the chair resolution authorizing the fire and our fire panel inspection and repair services be resolved that the Board of Trustees authorizes Executive Director CEO <coughs> to enter into an agreement with SA uh, Communale for annual fire, fire alarm and fire panel system inspections and repair services at the rate set forth in SA Communale's proposal for a one year term with the option to renew for. <clears throat> for the agreement for an additional two years, which agreement shall be subject to the approval of the Director of Legal Affairs, and which expenditure shall be charged to the General Fund uh, to object code 53340 building maintenance based on the location. So moved. So that's good. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Saifala? Yes. Mr. Corrigan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Parker? Yes. Exhibit 11, resolution authorizing agreement for annual fire suppression 
and sprinkler inspection, testing, and maintenance. <clears throat> on that the Board of Trustees authorizes the Executive Director, CEO as designated to enter into an agreement with SA Com Communale for annual fire suppression and sprinkler system inspections, testing, and maintenance at the rate set forth in SA Communale's proposal for a one year term with the option to renew for the agreement for the additional for an additional two years. Which agreement shall be subject to the approval of the Director of Legal Affairs, which expenditures shall be charged to general fund to object code 53340 building maintenance based on location. So moved. Second. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Saitala? Yes. Mr. Corgan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Frayer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. Uh, the remainder of my report is the fiscal officer's report, report A, report on investments, report B, report on conference and travel expenditures, report C, report on all vendor expenditures, report D, report on expenditures made from the owner's contingency funds for HUB, Jefferson, West Park, Woodland, Central Distribution Facility, Lorraine, Eastman, MLK Jr., Brooklyn, and Rockport branches, report D, Report on expenditures made from the owner's contingency funds for the high density shelving project report F. And fees paid for legal and consulting services for the period 10-01-22 through 12-31-22 report G. And that concludes the conclusion by that. Thank you so much, Trustee Seifla. We're now going to be moving into the Human Resource Committee report. Thank you. Exhibit 12 is the Cleveland Public Library Employment Report, I, uh, of which we have one new hiree, uh, four resignations, no terminations, and two retirements. I move for adoption of Exhibit 12. Second. Ms. Buttons? Yes. Mr. Seifalo? Yes. Mr. Corgan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. Yes. Exhibit 13 is retirement recognition citations. The citation has been issued for the following staff members on the occasion of their retirement. <laughs> Mr. Robert, um, Ronald Roberts, 35 years of service at the Brooklyn branch. Cheryl Williamson, 17 years of service at the South Brooklyn branch. Uh, I move adoption for these citations. And as the director says, we're gonna have a big party for all of them that were able to we had to miss during the pandemic, and he's paying for it. <laughs> Could I get a second? A uh, second. Ms. Butts? Got to be careful Mr. public phone. That's it. I'm buying everybody a, a drink and 60 straws. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Cyclone? Yes. Mr. Corrigan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker. Yes. Exhibit 14, one of the best programs that we've seen around in a long time. We had a good explanation from Lynn. Uh, if anybody has any uh, need to, for any questions, um, please ask them. But I think we've already reviewed this program. I told her I love the, the uh, price per client and they have an opportunity to have somewhere to go confidential. Uh, and get help. Uh, so I move that we um, don't need to read that first. So don't just the results. Yeah, just look. <laughs> Exhibit 14 resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Cleveland Public Library hereby authorizes the executive director, CEO, or his designee to enter into an agreement with Ease in an amount up to $42,000 for Ease work employee support and wellness and wellness i'm sorry program for period beginning march 1st 2023 and expiring february 28 2026 subject to approval of the director of legal affairs with the expenditure being allocated to object to object code 51900 salaries benefits and other benefits based on the employees organization code so moved. Second. Ms. Buns? Yes. Mr. Cyclone? Yes. Mr. Corrigan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? 
Yes. Mr. Hairston. Yes. Ms. Frager. Yes. And Mr. Parker. Yes. <laughs> the rest of my report uh, is the report on pay sick leave, report H, uh, employee demographics, report <clears throat> I, and insurance summary report, report J. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Harrison. Uh, we're now going to move into the Community Service Committee report. Trustee Corbin, please. Yes, the monthly activity report for uh, December is actually better than that. It's a year end report. And I really like this uh, post January meeting to get a chance to really look at what changed in 2022. Uh, the biggest observations I think is that despite the branch closures, we still have uh, increases in circulation. Branch closures to do the financial uh, facilities master plan performance. That uh, in physical circulation and media, uh, we're back basically bounding back from COVID numbers. And, and uh, the uh, as always, the main library. Um, uh, stays in the uh, essential part of the total circulation because of the strength of the collection. But you can also see that Wi Fi sessions, computer sessions, computer hours of use, new library cards, all those things are up in 2022 overall. Uh, the, the biggest jump of all is the number of reference questions that we re resolved uh, and took in was double in 22 from 21. And that's also a real sign of, of bounce back from COVID. Um, our uh, visitors, our the actual physical visits to the library and physical visits to the main library uh, are all up. So there's a real uh, chance to see that uh, uh, you know, the library both did a good public service with all its ability to reach out <coughs> during COVID when things were closed and we did our best to stay open or to uh, accommodate people with curb service and those things. But that the traditional library service that people are used to in Cleveland is continuing to grow. And it's obvious post uh, COVID that we are. Um, I'm always, uh, the, the fun part of this report is always the, the uh, looking at what the overall top circulated overdrive titles were. And it's still, I've got to meet this Colleen Hoover sometimes. <laughs> yeah. She just you know, has a fan base that rivals anything that any politicians ever had, that. as far as I can tell. Um, and then if you if you want the narrative, the year-end report that's been prepared there, a narrative at the end that Nancy did is just very, very good. And I just want to thank the staff for the quality of the um, graphics that we get now and the ability to see it at a glance basically how the library is doing. Um, the one thing I didn't, I, that I was going to ask Nancy, if sometime we can, if you could just tell me, because uh, 21 and was so different from 19, if you will, or 20 was so different from 19, I wonder if on a couple of these categories we might have since we're enough out of COVID now to do a look back, uh, to see, compare the 19 statistics, if you will, um, to, some, to what, where we're at. Now. I think that might be helpful if there's an easy way to do that. Yeah, I can get those and put them in there. That'd be great. <coughs> Just sort of a supplemental for next time. Yeah, that's I don't think it's going to be. Nice report does not better. <laughs> no, I understand. We're not going to bounce that path. No, 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 we're, there, there's no question. That it, just in terms of the number of people downtown, it's much fewer than there were. So not every, if you talk to the business community, um, only 60% of them are back to more than three days a week in terms of their ability. So that downtown's a different place, but um, I think in the long run with the Sherman Williams project and, and all the new housing downtown, uh, we're gonna continue to see uh, main library you know, I was on the elevator today. I came up a public elevator, and there was a lady who said this was her first time in the library when she was doing research. And first time in Maine. I think she's new to the city because she was doing city risk history research. And she said, I'm already blown away with everything I can see about this library. And she couldn't stop, you know, bubbling. <laughs> so that's always happening, I think. More yeah, little by little, it's coming, coming back. Little by little. Um, the other uh, portion of the Community Services Committee report is first the building status update, other than what we've already talked about, something additional, other than to commend 
John at West Park, which was the first oh, yeah. branch I went to when I was five years old, mm -hmm. more than 65 years ago. Um, the new West Park, the, the campus just turned out wonderful. We had more than 500 people, I think, come by during the grand opening. And um, not unlike the success of the, of, uh, the new Huff branch, um, there's a lot to commend, John, and for you and your staff and all our contractors. And I think we're meeting the promise that we made. Um, but is there something else you want to add besides talking about walls, which is the big thing here? Uh, no, sir. The director did ask me to provide um, uh, a reporting on the diversity and economic inclusion in the group one, which I'm going to do under the diversity, equity, and inclusion report. So I'll, I'll hold that. Okay. May I ask a question? Um, on the end. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe I talked to the director. I'm trying to figure out where I got this from. Are we doing some innovation, uh, reimagining some more work at Huff? Is that something that we're doing over there? Well, we recently got a grant from um, Brunings, which um, Huff is one of the branches that that money could be targeted for. We had some additional outside work that we had hoped to do as part of the initial construction, mm -hmm. which kind of went on the cutting room floor during value engineering budgeting a year and a half ago. So we're hoping to restore some of that. There'll be some outside programming area, maybe kind of a, a little almost amphitheater around the bio. Wow. As well. So we're hoping yeah. to um, be working, and I don't know if I'm not stepping on Shanice's toes. No, no. We're hoping to, to kind of move that forward over the next year. That is going to be fantastic. If they get that one building across the street from us done, and I did talk to some people about that, and you know who. Mm. What did um, you learn? Huh? What did you learn? Um, I did talk to some people about that building over there. <laughs> I learned that they're going to renovate the building, uh, mainly because you got League Park. What's the community center right next to us? Fatima. Fatima. Got us. And if that building gets done what they want to get done with it, that corner is going to be dynamite, especially mm -hmm. adding what you added to it. Mm -hmm. That would be a model yeah. because all those services that, that everybody needs was in that, it was in what, less than a block of each other. Yeah. And then the new homes. And then the new homes. Oh, let's don't talk about that right now. Yeah. Okay. The, the proposed new homes. The proposed. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> But yeah, the, the, but I thought I'd hear some. Thank you, John. Yeah. And the next part of the community services committee report is an advocacy task for something. Anything to add in addition? Yeah, to nothing Tim? to add. Okay, because Tim gave us a pretty good idea what our targets are. Um, and as to the foundation, sure. It, it, my, my report really focuses in on the director wanted me to focus in on Cleveland Reads. I just want to let the board know as of January 1st what our numbers are. Um, Trustee Rodriguez wanted it, but we can follow up in writing with this. Um, well, just hold on. Hold tight. Okay. Hold on. She'll be back. Okay. Well, I'll hold tight on numbers. But the other thing that we want to let the board know is we're launching the Cleveland Reads Company Challenge. And so, in essence, it's people that they can sign on if they have a they have, um, they want to show their support for the importance of reading literacy in the city. They can sign on as a sponsor. And we also have a menu of other options that they can do, such as doing a new book drive for CMSD. We'll be meeting with CMSD to talk about that. Um, they can also put window signs up. They can sign their, their, their um, staff up. Um, but if you have recommendations of organizations that you think would uh, want to demonstrate their support for reading literacy and the Cleveland Reading uh, Campaign, please let us know. Please let me know. Um, okay, now you can now, say. Okay. Um, so as of January 1st, uh, books read are um, 10,210. We have new registrations of 3,676. And um, people who have earned badges, it's 6,768. Uh, we are launching our internal steering committee. Our first meeting is next week where we're working through all of these things. The director keeps pushing us and saying, it's not enough. And it really stretches us because we know this is an important subject and we're all in. Question. Yes, sir. I'm not giving you a job. Okay? I'm, just tell you. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm just going to tell you what worked for me. Yeah. I mean, I work for everybody else. I was doing a project. So I called the director. I said, Our kids are really starving for books mm -hmm. that could be their own, especially around Christmas time. Give a child a book, and boom, Project Reef popped up. Mm -hmm. So, being 80 years old, I got my brother in law and I went down. Loaded up by truck and signed for it. 
and if you had seen it, and I got pictures of it, these kids went absolutely crazy because they had a brand new book. Okay. And I even showed I showed uh Felton some pictures of the way we did it. Mm -hmm. My point is it's like a concerted way to get some of those churches involved mm -hmm. that have tutoring programs and stuff like that. That is a population we need to. We need to. Yeah. Some people have after school programs, stuff like that. Yeah. Those pockets like that, that's what we yeah. have. Yes. Because I'll be ready, I'll be ready for you because we have a youth. This gentleman right there has a youth organization. It's dynamite. His name is Anthony Parker, just in case you didn't talk. <laughs> what do you think, Anthony? Could you put that within your program? Yeah. Would love to come and present. Sure. We'll figure something out. You know, we saw the same excitement on Day of the Dead. We gave out 600 books, and those kids really were excited to get yeah. them. Their faces, you know, some of the moms told us that they didn't have books at home, and they were glad to have them at home. Yeah. And, and I think just to build on what you're saying, one of the wonderful things that we have, in addition to our, our own staff who are supporting this, we've um, embarked on neighborhood ambassadors. And so part of our fundraising efforts are we pay them, it's a small stipend a month. We've worked with our internal folks to do all the stuff we have to do from a legal perspective. But they're the boots on the ground. They're the people who are from the community who are going out in the community and helping people get, get signed up. So if you guys are working in the city, we have that. our neighborhood ambassadors who are signing up to do the work. So we are super <laughs> grateful. I, and I was thinking, because I did the same thing, I took some books to uh, my church and we passed them out on a Christmas Eve to the kids and they were super excited. But the one thing I was thinking, if we could include some type of uh, insert about how to sign up for Cleveland Reads. Yes. You know, we are giving uh, the books away. And yes, we and did it for uh, and Dia de los Muertos, yeah. but if we have some type of insert in there to help someone navigate or let's sit out there with an iPad and sign mm -hmm. these kids up or in, or in the neighborhood, I think that would be a great idea too. Mm -hmm. yeah. But thank you for everything you're doing. That's all I have. Thank you. And uh, final. Oh, uh, I have, I'm sorry. I have yeah. one more thing. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Uh, in March, uh, we'll do um, the fundraising year in review um, and the year ahead um, with Greg Stefani, the foundation board president. He'll we'll be back in March for that. Perfect. And the final report for community services committee is a diversity, equity, and inclusion update. And, and uh, the director had asked John to kind of give us where phase one. Uh, goals and everything went, and we've got some to pass out. Let's see there. Too. I'm sorry, I just didn't make it into the report you have on the screen in front of you. This is an update of a document that you may recall seeing before. So this is the diversity board for economic inclusion as contract participation on the projects under the management of the bank building company. Um, the top block, the top five lines there is an executive summary of everything that's under. So for uh, the cost of work subtotal is $21 million. Um, so again, this is just the Gilbane portion of the projects and it's just the construction portion of the work. Um, our, our institutional goals established at the time we contracted are indicated there. Minority, minority business enterprise at 20%, female women owned businesses at 9%, small businesses at 15%. The amalgamated um, results, and this is based on now uh, showing you this as, as the guaranteed maximum price. When we started construction, we showed you this as an intern during construction. Now, with Jefferson and Huff and West Park completed, and Woodland and the Central Distribution Facility near substantial completion. These numbers are really firmed up. So you see our enterprise tracking is at 30% uh, MBE, 24% FBE, and 50% for small businesses. So that did exceed our goals. Um, the individual project breakdowns are below that. So if you're interested in where West Park, Jefferson, Woodland, Central Distribution, or Huff came in as a specific project, that's shown below. Uh, but again, that, those top five lines are the executive summary. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
I would like to do something very similar with uh, Regency projects. So again, that would be Eastman, uh, the rain, Brooklyn, and Rockport, uh, up on board. Uh, and then Kanzika is handled separately uh, uh, with the as the MLK project, and that's kind of a one-off hand separately. So I'll provide those as well. All right, do we still get a request from DCP for that annual? <laughs> I think it comes out in February. Okay. Yeah, their overall uh, diversity. To to get this stuff in there yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they'll give us a set of questions and we'll fill it out and, and submit it in their yeah. survey. I sat in on their fourth quarter meeting. They rebranded a little bit. It's called Cube Town. So it's construction utilities, building. So we'll certainly provide our contribution in terms of our construction contracting to our town. I think it's a good story to tell. Yep. Still got a long way to go, but four libraries down. <clears throat> this is where we are. And well, we got a lot more than that to go. <laughs> All of us are still saved by then. So. And Jen, let me ask you the most obnoxious question a lawyer on a board can ask yourself as a senior staff person. Um, how much likelihood is, has there been or will there be for litigation on any of our construction projects at this point? I mean, we won't be surprised to hear that I'd say the greatest risk would be on the MLK projects. Right. Um, the portion of the work in portion of the work that's going on now is the podium contract. Just so as a reminder, two building owners, us and the developer, three contracts. The podium is the, is the foundation and superstructure of the building, which is being constructed under the developer's contract. We contributed our share of that to the um, shared costs. And then there's a separate contract that the developer has to build their apartments. And then there's a separate contract that the library has. And we're just about to start that in earnest for the library info. Um, I'm bringing you all this up because there's been concerns with the schedule and the quality um, control of the concrete contractor. And there have been uh, some additional costs sought by a subcontractor to the developer, which could come over to us. And so there are questions on schedule and costs. Um, there's not a formal claim to the library as of yet, um, but that's a complicated project. And I think the risk that something could arise at some point is. And on the projects that were finished, I'm not aware of any litigation uh, risk. No, know. sir, I think we're pretty good. Um, you know, we've had a few change out close orders. Really appreciate the board support. We've had to come back for budget increases to address issues that arise. Um, the insurance claim on the Lorraine fire is being finalized. We have all the costs now from our construction manager. We've been in pretty regular communication with, um, with our agent and the carrier. So um, other than that, I, I, I'd be surprised if anything other than came up other than the MLK fire. When is Lorraine going to open again? Well, I was hoping to give you a date today. We haven't yeah. quite got that locked in on the very first time. Yeah, yeah. Was no. Angel, you know, well, we've got a specific date in mind. And that will help the wall Just quickly. MLK is going to be, I mean, that's, that's one of my branches. Tonight's the Jews. Once it is complete, I, I can't remember. Are there apartments? Is there an apartment building above it? Mm -hmm. so it's the same building. So we'll have the lower two floors, 3,000 square feet, and they'll have nine stories of apartments above us. OK. Yes, if you go over, you can see significant movement in, in that project. They, they've done a lot. I think, John, if you could also just quickly talk about Garden Valley. Okay. Oh, yeah, Garden Valley. So, um, the concerns there, um, you know, we were frankly, and so there were concerns of staff and maybe patrons on indoor air quality. So, the branch was, uh, and then there's separately, there was a heating concern. So, Garden Valley is the lease facility, it's not owned by the library. Um, Burn Bell Card Belton Corporation is the building owner. Um, it turned out on in terms of the the HVAC issue was a broken rooftop unit. We suspected that something going on with that unit was developing an odor into the building. Um, the landlord is working to repair or replace that rooftop unit. In the meantime, we have some supplemental heaters in the building that have not had difficulty other than that 
real cold snap before Christmas. We have not had difficulty maintaining temperature and relative humidity in the building. So we've been kind of chasing this odor. Um, we, we did call in EA group to do indoor air quality sampling. Um, they were out uh, last week or the week before. Uh, the, the carbon monoxide and the carbon dioxide came out um, within building standards, actually below what was measured outside the building in the parking lot. So good there. There's also a mobile test and uh, VOC bottle organic compound test that's in the labs. We should have that, I hope, by tomorrow, but by early next week, if not. Um, and then we took the opportunity of the downtown town to um, do painting touch-ups throughout the building, do a deep clean of carpet and vestibule. The walk off mats in the vestibule and the carpet and the, and the main building. So, uh, I really hope that if we get a clean air quality report, final report next week, the director might be in a position to reopen the branch. Okay. okay. I've already heard from Anton Gardena that they can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes the community services. Um, I'm just going to go over the new business real quick. Uh, we had the resolution to explore options for disposition of the old Huff Branch Library property. Um, do you want to talk about it briefly, Director? Yeah, um, well, we have our old Huff Branch, which um, is still in fairly good shape. Um, and previously, uh, when Councilman Fisher Jones was there, there was a discussion <laughs> of us turning over um, the building to uh, him and to the ward, and that they would look for ways of bringing nonprofits into um, the building. Uh, the current councilwoman is not necessarily interested in that model. No. Um, and therefore, our what we do with it and how there's the disposition of the of the branch or if we decide on something uh, else to do with the branch, what we'd like to do is be able to explore the options and then come back to the board. So ultimately this is really just an ask, can we as a staff go out and look at two or three options for what we do with the hub branch and come back to the board and, and give you those options? So moved. Second. Well, I was going to read the resolve part, <laughs> just putting it out there. <laughs> Be resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Cleveland Public Library hereby authorizes the director, CEO, or his designee to explore all options for the disposition of the Old Huff Branch building at 1566 Crawford Avenue. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Saikala? Yes. Mr. Corgan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Hairston? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Parker? Yes. The other uh, piece is uh, the resolution for Trustee Allen Saikala. Be it resolved that the Board of Library Trustees for itself and on behalf of the library staff and the community commence Mr. Saikala for his exemplary public service and extends appreciation and sincere best wishes to its esteemed and valued colleague for continued success in all his endeavors. Second. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Saikalaw? Would it be a conflict? Yes. Mr. Gordon? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? And no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Mr. Yes. And Mr. Parker. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Seifler lives right down the street from MLK. I'll make a suggestion. He becomes the ambassador, community ambassador, for watching over MLK. <laughs> oh, he will be. He'll probably be the first one there when we open it <laughs> to make sure it's being open. <laughs> and and, and I, I back you up. Yes. You got See, it. there you go. <laughs> I got to like you. That's right. That Memorial Naughty yeah. Hammer says. He loves yeah. that one. Oh, yeah, I like that 17 acres out there. Um, and as part of the, that was the end of the news business. Uh, and as part of the president's report, I just want to remind everyone to, if they're able to sign up for the OSC trustee, uh, it's on March 4th, it's in Dublin, or it's actually hybrid. You could do it, uh, register. Maybe we could do something here on, on at, in the board room or if you want to go to Dublin. So Michael did send out an email. Please look through it if you are able to. It does. 
He did, and let him know if, uh, which way or who could attend in person or who wants to have something here for us. Okay. Yeah. It could be done either way. But that concludes my portion of the report. Uh, Director? Uh, I just wanted to bring to everyone the annual report, the financial report. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the financial. Yes. Yeah. That ended uh, for 2021. So I just wanted to make sure. Oh, actually, it's the annual report yeah. that yeah. you have here. I got this. Sorry. Yeah, we have that. Yes. So this one's actually, we're kind of running behind. So we have 2021s here. And I got them moving to make sure that 2022 comes out in May of 2023. So we will work on that. Mm -hmm. I, if it's any consolation, director again of the vision of history, uh, twice under Marilyn Mason's directive, we were more than a year behind um, on, on the annual report. Again, it was, it was an economic and construction issue at the time. And uh, so it's, that's happened before. So you don't have to teach yourself. Uh, well, we will work on that. I also yeah. wanted to bring to everybody this uh, see also report that gives everybody examples of what we've had in the past. But for those, this is, I think, really, really interesting. Lastly, just uh, from me, I will be next week uh, at ALA Midwinter. And so um, I will uh, just be there for a few days. And I have to do a presentation there, but it, um, they have brought back Midwinter, which had gone away during the mm -hmm. so I haven't heard you say that. New Orleans. In New Orleans. Oh, that's yeah. the last time you and I. Perfect. Were. Yeah. So, so, but I, and I would uh, very much, um, I think the overall annual conference this year is in Chicago. And we'd like to have a strong presence of board and staff because it's so close to us and easy to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they've they've found a way they to kind of rebound from from that as far as the conference. I think it'll be a great opportunity for us. What when is the when is that meeting? It'll be the end of June. End of June. Perfect. Ready? Well, thank you, Director. Uh no, no, not yet. Thank you very much. We have Oh, no, we're, to to the no, we're not no. going. We're not there yet. Uh, my friend Stephen is here, oh, and I'm, I'm sure sorry. he would like to make a public comment. Sure. We've missed you. I've even asked about you. How you been? Yeah, well, yeah, I've, I've been. Yeah, thanks to the pandemic, I'll, I'll stop doing virtual meetings once in a while here because of the pandemic. But it's great to be back here after the, now the pandemic is not as much. So I was able to come here. So thank you for and, joining us today. And, 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 and I've been known for talking about how I like historical technology and I use vinyl records and tapes and VHS tapes and stuff like that. And, and I, I also like historical buildings. So so I'm sad to see the Cleveland Playhouse building and University Circle coming down. I'm going to miss that building. Yeah. And, 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 I was also I also been talking about the accelerator dryer and how loud it is. Well, I'm glad that many new restrooms I hear are going to be single occupant restrooms where the, 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 the dryer only comes on if you want to use it. So I'm glad about the single occupant restroom trend that's coming in the library. And I also hope the hand sanitizer pump. I hope you keep the I hope you keep the hand sanitizer pumps because sometimes I don't have to always use the sink for water or dryer. Sometimes for minor cases you just Wash your hands with the hand sanitizer. So I, I, I hope to keep those hand sanitizers around. So I like using those sanitizers. I like using the sanitizers to wash my hands. I don't always have to use the sink or dryer since I don't like the dryers or sinks. Sometimes I use the sanitizer pumps. Well, I don't think it's going anywhere. We're going to keep the hand sanitizer. And yes, we are uh, doing the single use uh, restrooms. Oh, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much. And also, also, I'm glad. Also, also, I'm also glad you also have designated eating areas for the public because there's more of a trend in shopping malls that, that they think it's they think it's private property. They may not always like you eating your own food on their space. And there's places like Asia Plaza or other malls where they might not be too friendly about you bringing your own food because they want you to buy down there. So. It's good that you have some designated eating areas for the public, you know, whatever health allows you to do it. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you. you so much. And thank you for joining us. Okay, thanks, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to move into uh, adjourn to the 2023 organizational meetings. Yes. yes. One thing because uh, Lynn, oh, Tuesday Lynn. we had cake. So we, Let we them can have, have cake. more cake for Trusty Sapphire, but we did bring cookies for. Trusty side. Oh. So what, while we do the organizational meeting, I was wanted to make sure someone might want to get up and get some cookies while we 
we can sit around or we'll wait till afterwards, however you want to do it. Help, Help yourself. Anybody else? I'm going to join There you go. We'll take a, a, a brief couple minutes and then we'll go on with the. Oh, okay. Well, we could. Um, well, you know what? I am going to go ahead and call the organizational meeting to order. Okay. Anthony has to go. Um, go. Mr. Cyclone? Yes. Here. Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Yes. So the first order of meeting is um, the election of officers. Okay, may I have your attention, please? May I have While your you attention. Your Go for it. Mainly because I got a four o'clock and then other folks got some things too. And as Felton says, it's time for y'all to go back to work. So, <laughs> I have a responsibility and, uh, that was given to me some years ago of heading up the nomination committee for officers. Over the past three, four months, uh, the president has spearheaded a retreat for all board members so we get to understand exactly what our roles and responsibilities for. Some of the kinds of things that have popped up for us to really take a look at is our, our values. And one of our values is to take a look at how to grow younger people at some of these jobs that we got. And you're gonna see that reflected in today's nomination. So I'm encouraging my colleagues to vote for that, vote for the entire ticket. The ticket reads as such, uh, president for president, one of the best leaders in the city of Cleveland, Ms. Rodriguez, secretary and historian, Tom Corgan, and, uh, I will no longer be the vice president and we're nominating Mr. Anthony Parker for that particular position. It's time for us to grow. Uh, since I've been knowing it since he was 17, then I'll make sure he does what he's supposed to do. <laughs> so I'm asking for a full board unanimous vote. So moved. Second. Ms. Buttons? Yeah. Mr. Sykema? Yes. Mr. Corkin? Yes. Mr. Regas? Yes. Mr. Harrison. Yes. Ms. Fryer. Yes. And Mr. Parker. Yes. I guess so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, we were waiting for. <laughs> what did he say? Did we surprise you or did you know? Yeah, he talked to me about it. All right, it. good. Well, no, he told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> as recently as a few minutes ago. <laughs> and, um, I want to thank the nominating committee and I move to make the following changes in the committee uh, in the committee assignments. Second. Ms. Butts? Yes. Mr. Seifel? Yes. Mr. Corgan? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Fryer? Yes. And Mr. Park? Yes. That exhibit one of the organizational meeting is the election of fiscal officer and appointment of deputy fiscal officer. For it resolved that Carolyn Carey Kronecki be elected to serve as fiscal officer for the year 2023 organizational meeting through the year 2024 organizational meeting. And that a stipend of $500 per month be paid for the duties as fiscal officer. And be it resolved that Laura Armstrong be appointed to serve as deputy fiscal officer from the year 2023 organizational meeting through the year 2024 organizational meeting and that the stipend of $350 per month be paid for the duties as deputy fiscal officer. So moved. Second, and I want to point out for our newest board member, uh, historically, at this point, I remind everybody that one of the reasons that we uh, do this resolution with an additional stipend <laughs> is that according to the statutes of the state of Ohio and the criminal code, the only people who almost certainly could go to jail for doing something wrong about the library are the person named fiscal officer and deputy fiscal officer. So I always said, uh, the very first time I did this, I think is almost 30 years ago now, and Joan Tompkins was quite shocked when I told her that we were counting on her to go to jail for us if she needed to. And uh, so I, it's only fair to say- to it every year. <laughs> so I just want to continue the tradition that's what this means, that, that these are the people most responsible for any misspent funds. And I'm very proud to say that Carrie and Laura have taken both a good sense of humor about that comment, but on the other hand, the diligence and 
uh, perseverance to do everything right that they've always done, and I expect them to continue. To do. So thank you. And at this time, I dr I didn't do the vote. Oh, I'm Ms. sorry. Lund. Sorry. Yes. Mr. Sykes. Yes. Mr. Corrigan. Yes. Mr. Yes. Rodriguez. Yes. Mr. Harrison. Yes. Ms. Fryer. Yes. And Mr. Parker. Yes. Okay. And at this time, I want to uh, call the board meeting of January 19, 2023, closed. Thank you. Great. Thank Great. You. Thank you.